Testing one two, one two, testing one two. Testing one two. So when we say we want reparations, it's part of the, the claim. That's right. We want a settlement. And it is just. As Roger Graham said, they stole us, they sold us, they owe us. Reparations now. Thank you. Crimes were committed, injuries were suffered, the injuries still remain, and we know who the perpetrators of those criminals are. And if this is a nation of law and order, if this is a city of law and order, then those crimes must be justly addressed. And so we're here to make that demand. Congressional side, H.R. 40 was introduced in 1989. It was revised in 2017 by uh, a group of, of panel that was called together by uh, Dr. Ron Daniels and the National African American Reparations Commission. I'm a, a member of that commission. I sit on that commission. I think Dr. Winbush was part of the initial group that was uh, charged to revise H.R. 40. And one of the things that I wanted to put in, into that revised bill was that we don't use the standards of reparations that this government wants to use, or white America wants to use. We want to use the standards of reparations that is based on international norms and international law. And under international law, reparations must, quote, wipe out all consequences of the crime, unquote. It must wipe out all consequences. In order to wipe out all consequences, the state must engage in what is called full repair, full reparations. And that full reparations has five components. And we wrote this into the legislation. Those five components are one, cessation and guarantees of non-repetition. The nation must cease whatever bad acts it's doing. We know that there are countless laws here in America, state laws and city laws, that have a disproportionate negative effect on people of African descent. They were called black codes in the 1600s and 1700s. They have the same effect as black codes, but they're called race neutral today. Those laws must be stopped. The second component of poor reparations is restitution and repatriation. And this is where some of the economic and educational type of structures have to be put in place. The systematic overturning of the racist structures in this country is part of the restitution. The third component is compensation. Yes, compensation is a component of reparations, and there should be monetary compensation awarded to people of African descent in this country. That's in HR 40. The fourth, the fourth component is satisfaction. How do you return the dignity back to the people whose dignity was eroded as a result of these crimes you committed against them? All the history in this country has to be retold. That's right. All the curriculum books in this country have to be rewritten. Well. Right? Yeah. Apologies, monuments, museums, those type of things also meet the standard of, of uh, satisfaction. Dr. Winbush talked about the CARICOM, wanting museums, major museums in the Caribbean. That's part of satisfaction. That's part of returning the dignity to the people. I was in China in 2016, and I'm walking down the street, and old Chinese women are walking on the other side of me. Other side, they move over to the other side of the street as I'm walking past. Now, I'm not 20 years old. I'm 58 years old. I was 55 at that time. Why would she be scared of me? If it wasn't for the exported image of black people that this country is just to do. And so she was scared of me, and it was not just one. It was several instances where that took place. So our image has been, has been damaged yes. globally as a result of these crimes that have been committed against us. So satisfaction is a component. The fourth component, or the fifth component, is rehabilitation for the hard mind and spirit damage that our people have suffered and still suffer. 
And so those are, that's what's written into this, uh, this legislation, H.R. 40. You have a copy of the H.R. 40 primer. What, I'm just, what I've just talked about is in this primer, those five components and what some of the uh, policies can be used to meet those five components. Currently, there are 120 co-sponsors of this legislation. Never has there been more than 40, 45. There's 120 co-sponsors. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee put, took up this bill. It's going to call for a markup. A markup is where, in the lower committee, she asked the, the full Judiciary Committee to debate the issue and vote on it. And if it's passed, it's out of uh, judiciary, goes to the full House for, for a floor vote. And so we're expecting that to happen in early 20, uh, 20, 2020. Currently, there are 17 uh, Republicans in the Judiciary Committee and 24 Democrats. So we have 17 Democrats who have already signed on as co-sponsors. So those last seven Democrats are going to sway this particular bill uh, one way or the other. And so the COBRA has campaigned that we're working to get those other seven signed on, at least four signed on. We have 51 of the 50 CBC members that are co-sponsored to the legislation. So this is the first time in the history of this country since the Reconstruction has there been a possibility for both houses of Congress to debate this issue of redress. Of reparations and we cannot allow this time to be squandered we have to be working hard making this demand in the presidential race no Democrat has won a majority of the white vote in the last 50 years not one and it ain't gonna happen the Democratic Party knows it cannot win without the black vote. In the last 50 years, Republicans on average received 55% of the white vote. Hispanic and Asian votes practically cancel itself, itself out. For every two votes, say Hispanic or Asian votes for a Democrat, they vote once for a Republican. And so there's a, a, only a net one positive vote. Democrats cannot win with Asian and Hispanic votes. The only way they can win is with the black vote, and they know this. I was at Congressman Conyers' funeral last Monday, and President Clinton was there. And the first thing he said is, well, we know that neither Carter, nor myself, nor Barack Obama could have won without the black vote. Currently, the Republican Party receives about 55% of the white vote. And this is just a graph to show how what percentage of the white vote that Republicans received since 1976, and what percentage of the Democrats have received the white vote. And so we can see clearly that if it was a contest between white folks, Republicans would have won every year. But the more we're in the mix, we determine the outcome. And so this is the time, just like I was saying, reparations demand, you get that final notice in the mail. And if you don't care, I, oh, I got a final notice from the Department of Finance last week. <laughs> For a water bill, right? Now, I have to pay that water bill because I want to stay in my house. And I want to, you know, bathe myself. But if I didn't care about that house, I would ignore that water bill. The Democrats right now want the White House. We make the demand. We make the demand. They cannot ignore us if we're collectively making the demand. Because we have what they want. Now, State Assemblyman, I'm a revolutionary. Well, we, as we talked before, there's some reform things that we can do on the way to revolution. And so I think in this democratic election, or in this presidential election, black folks have to be really pulling together as the number one issue for us is this demand for reparations. And we can do it if we do it collectively. Yes. Making demand in the city of Chicago, how does it relate? Of course, we fully support uh, the, the efforts on Dr. Wilson and, and Alderman Sawyer. We thank Dr. Willie Wilson and Alderman Sawyer for the leadership on this issue. And Cobra has prepared 10 talking points on the, on the, rep, on the rep, reparations commission. You have that in your uh, primer, is this document. And I'm not gonna read all of this, just a, a few of those talking points. Number, uh, 
for number five, it is well documented that racially discriminatory public policy directed toward blacks in Chicago has, had, has led greatly to the gross disparities of the quality of life for black Chicago as compared to all ethnic, other ethnic communities in, in Chicago. So here we're talking about public policy that's created the conditions that we face today. Some of these policies amounted to outright theft of black wealth and near total disempowerment and economic devastation of the black community. These accumulating harms show themselves in massive health challenges, deteriorating communities, increased violent crime, poor educational performance, a decimated business class, and intensified hopelessness and trauma among other injuries. Is uh, Jack McNamara in the house? Jack, can you stand up? Yes, Professor Jack McNamara. Yes. Now, Professor McNamara, I asked him to stand up because he led a group of, of, of students in researching the amount of theft that this city extracted out of the black community from the periods of 1950 to 1970 via redlining, via housing discrimination. The amount of theft. With the complicity of the government and their agencies. And that number for that 20 year period amounts to four to six billion dollars in today's money. So this city is also complicit in some of the crimes that have been committed against us. We know from 2007 to 2012, black people in this country lost 200 billion dollars in wealth. From 1865 to 2007, we amassed 380 billion dollars in wealth. It should have been 10 times as much as that wasn't for the crimes that were committed against our people during that time. But in five short years, we lost over 60% of it during the subprime uh, housing scandal. Yeah. Yeah. Billions here in the city of Chicago. Yeah. So we are, we are living today the impact of those crimes committed against us right. with city complicity. That's right. yeah. We're living it right here today. We know about the 100 years of terror in this country from white mob action to police terror, police action against our people from 1919 race riots to the murder of Chairman Fred Hampton and then the torture of John uh, Burge victims to present day Laquan McDonald and other criminal actions that happened in the police department. These are crimes committed by the city of, this, of, of, of Chicago, their departments, and, and as Roger said, crimes were committed, injuries have been suffered, injuries remain, so reparations are due. And so we stand completely in agreement that there should be a City of Chicago Reparations Commission. That's right. And we have scholars and we have allies on all sides of the spectrum that also agree with this, and again, Ottoman Rodney Sawyer and Dr. Willie Wilson, we couldn't be here today in this space if it wasn't for your leadership. In closing, Cobra has a model, a uh, reparations ordinance that we've been working with, with uh, Dr. Conrad World and, and Commissioner uh, Richard Boykin, uh, that looks at what type of city public policy can be created in those five areas of, of, of uh, reparations in the five areas of full repair. And we'll, we'll, we'll be more than happy to share that with you. But, but right now, we want you to agree, one, that this is necessary, and two, that you will do something to help, it, help make it a reality. Also in our primer is, <coughs> on the bottom half of this page, it says, meet with the total. Meet with us. Strategize with us. Bring your leadership capabilities, bring your ideas to this body, and let's collectively move this issue forward and stand with these two giants who are still with us and make this a reality. Right. Reparations now. We're right around the corner from 2300 West Monroe, where on December 4th, 1969, in the wee small hours of the morning, Everett Hanrahan 
and the law enforcement agency assassinated Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. I also want to point out that this movie, Harriet, that's out, just hold up because Hollywood is producing a movie on the Panthers and William O'Neill's role in infiltrating the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. I just want to point out we need to be careful about the debates we're having between each other over Hollywood because they created the model in 1915 in Birth of a Nation in creating the imagery of Toms, Coons, Mulattoes, Mammies, and Bucks. And if we don't finance our own imagery, our own movies, not to say that protest hasn't gotten some concessions out of Hollywood, but let's not kill each other off on social media about Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was a great woman. We know what she did. And let her rest in peace and let Hollywood go over there as we continue organizing and using this occasion for many of our young people in these schools across America who have no clue as to who, what Harry Tubman is. And they go going to the movie, we call them for a boycott, and it appears that more people are going to the movie. So that ought to tell us something. Just a word of caution. In July, of 2003, I wrote Minister Farrakhan a letter and asked him to convene all the reparations organizers and activists that we could identify. We met at the Salam restaurant July 23rd, 2003. And many of the activists and organizers since that time have become ancestors. Imari Obadelli was there. Hannibal Lafrique was there. Dorothy Lewis Benton was there. And in that meeting, our great political scientist, Dr. Ron Walter, was not able to attend. And he sent me a paper that's been buried in my archive that I think is important to resurface. And the title of the paper was Unity in the Movement for African Reparations in America. And although we have a lot of different views in our activism on reparations, I think it's time to call a truce. I think it's <laughs> Let me just say this, in the paper, Dr. Walter said our unity is old, before Europe and before America was born. The foundation of our political systems was rooted in the concept of consensus. For example, when important issues were called for in the Ashanti culture, the chief called a meeting known as the Ashanti Kisa, which means the big sit down. In South Africa, among the Nguni, the practice was known as the Ndaba. And we took that concept out of that meeting, and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan put his mighty resources, and we went to Jackson, Mississippi, where our great brother, Chokwe Lumumba, eventually became the mayor. And we filled up a stadium of more than 20,000 people talking on reparations. We went to Houston, Texas, and had an Andaba, a big sit down, and another 50,000 people came out to that meeting. We went to Baltimore, Maryland, where Dr. Winbush hosted us and had another thousands and thousands of black people discussing reparations. And our final Andaba was in Atlanta, Georgia. So given the fact that social media now has entered into the fray. I would suggest that none of this will work as long as we're divided.
And so, as someone who over the last several months has been engaged in this ideological debate at a very high level taking on forces that I absolutely disagree with, does it mean that at this point in our maturity and political development that we can't strive for unity? Because if we don't have unity on this question of reparation, they will continue to do what they always do, and that is to divide and conquer us, and we will not have accomplished our objective. So what I'd like to do now is to turn it over to my friend, the Alderman of the Sixth Ward, Alderman Rod Sawyer. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank everybody for being here today. I'm going to open it up first to my colleagues if they had any questions. But before I do that, uh, I, I know you heard uh, Brother Cam Howard talk about uh, a young sister in Evanston, a colleague of ours, an alderman in Evanston, has doing something similar. And he wanted her to have a couple of minutes to speak. And I want to get, grant her that opportunity. So I want to bring up for a few moments before we go into public comment, uh, comment from the alderman, then public comment. Our colleague in Evanston, Alderman Robin Simmons. Thank you, Alderman. Thank you for giving me a moment to speak. I didn't come prepared to do so. I really came to be in a room with thought leaders and like-minded folks that understand why reparation. And I am an Alderman in Evanston, the Alderman of the Fifth Ward, which is the historically black community. And I have only been in office two and a half years, and through my frustration of doing community development work and diversity and inclusion and working hard to make a difference, to bridge the economic gap and deal with our disparities, I got to the conclusion of reparations. So in Evanston, to date, I'll fast forward my efforts over the last several months, my colleagues have agreed with me, and we have unanimously approved a move forward for reparations in Evanston. So I have to thank my colleagues because I'm only one of nine votes, but the timing is right. The community was prepared. We've had hundreds of resolutions and ceremonial actions and honorific notions, and it was not enough. And my challenge to the community is, why don't we move past apology now and put some action and some funds behind these commitments that we have um, articulated for all of these years? So we are working towards a goal that's a small city. It's $10 million, and that's not enough for our city. But it's certainly is a commitment beyond apology. So my proposal beyond that is that we use our tax revenue for the new recreational marijuana sales to fund our reparation. Why shouldn't we? Our community was most damaged from the impact of marijuana sales, and now it's a glamorous multi-billion dollar industry. We should certainly benefit from that tax revenue. So that is my proposal. We're in budget season right now. I ask that you all lift me and my city, Evanston, um, in good spirits as we move forward for reparation in Evanston. And I am here with you, Cam. Thank you so much for supporting me in Evanston. Um, I can't tell you what it has meant to me. Sometimes I have felt like alone and I'm crazy and nobody gets it. But organizations um, like this here have been a big support, even in Evanston. So Chicago is not alone. Reparations now everywhere. All politics are local. And if they want to argue it at a national level, we certainly have demonstrable damages in Chicago and Evanston and every place else where we can work on it at a local level. So thank you for this moment. I appreciate it. And all the best to you. Thank you, Alderman. We'll definitely be in contact with you and see how the progress you're making in Evanston. At this time, uh, I wanted to see if there were any... Thank you. 
There being no further business before the committee on the motion of Alderman Dow, uh, moves to adjourn the meeting. So moved.